Jesus has been speaking to his disciples and the message really started in Jesus' words to them. And remember that Jesus is about to bring his upper room discourse to a close. Jesus is encouraging his disciples and Jesus starts with these words that have brought so much comfort to the hearts of many and it's found in chapter 14 in verse 1 and Jesus says let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me Jesus gives a statement here in their hearts not being troubled and he's encouraging them that though they have heard some pretty difficult things um, up until this point and Jesus you know continuing on in reminding them of his departure from them and then he kind of gives them this overview at you know chapter 15 in verses 18 that the world's going to hate them and then he reminds them that when they are hated by the world to remember that they hated him first and so in a sense what Jesus is saying is you know you're going to experience trials and tribulation and understand that all of this is a result of you being associated with me and so the reason why you're going to experience these things is because of me and your relationship with me so in one case some would say well then if we're not being persecuted what does that say about us it says a lot. In one case, we can say, because of what Jesus said, because of me, they will hate you. Then if they don't hate you, then you're not in Christ. And, you know, true followers of Jesus will be hated by the world. So this is something that we will experience. Now, I want to share uh, something with you that Paul said. To, um, to the believers. And he talked about their suffering and that it would be granted. In Philippians chapter 1, in verse 29, this is what Paul said. And this is out of the New Living Translation. It says, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Let me, let me read that again. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, New Living Translation. Paul says, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ. So look at this. He's saying it is a privilege. This relationship we have with Jesus is a privilege, right? So he says, You've not only been given the privilege to trust in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. So to suffer for Christ is a privilege. Now, we talk a lot about suffering, but what Jesus is preparing them for is really his departure and him not physically being with them, okay? Because up until this point, Jesus has done pretty much everything for them. And, you know, a child loves when a parent does everything for them. They do. I, I, was, I was spoiled, not by my mom, but by my grandmother. And, uh, boy, that woman did everything for me. I mean everything. Iron my clothes. I mean everything. She always had me looking sharp, man. You know, and people make fun of me because I still crease my pants, but she would crease my pants. She would crease my shirts. And, um, yeah, my white T-shirts she would crease. Oh, I love that. You know, so, and, you know, she always had me looking cute, man. But, but, you know, I, I love the fact that, that, that she would do everything for me. And, and, and in a sense, it helped me out in life, you know, because she didn't just do it. I, I would see how and, and the way she did it because I figured, you know, she's getting older and, and, and eventually I'm going to have to do this on my own kind of thing. And so, but, but for the most part, the joy and the privilege of having her there to take care of those day-to-day -day necessities, some of you can relate. And... Um, for those of us that have children, especially small children, your children could relate to that. 
And, and some of you, your children are not little no more. You, you need to stop doing for them, okay? Let them do on their own now, okay? They're too big, all right? They're too old, <laughs> you know? But, but, you know, that's the whole thing is one that gets so used to their parent doing for them, what do they always think of? Everything's going to be okay because of, right? It's like, I know I'm not going to go without because, and that's fine. That's fine. We, we joke about that, but I am thankful. Here I am in my 40s, and I love when my mom says, I'm going to cook dinner for you. What do you want to eat? Boy, homemade tortillas, refried beans with the manteca from the box. <laughs> and, you know, and she even offers to, hey, I'll go clean your house. You know, I will, I will you know, I'll help you, you know, whatever you need me to do. And I like that even though I don't need it, but I just love the fact that, that she's there. And then the other day I was driving with my kids and we were, you know, all were together and we we're going somewhere. And I says, you know, well, one day, you know, your, your grandma's not going to be here uh, because my grandmother had already went to be with the Lord. Um, she was a couple of years younger than my mom's age now. And, and then I says, you know, and think about it. Like, there's really nobody left other than like us. And I started kind of laying it out like this is going to be your family, you know, and you realize that those that care for you or, you know, help you, they're not always going to be with you always. This is what Jesus was telling the disciples. He says, you know, I'm going to leave. And for three years, and we're not saying like, wow, they were friends for three years. No, these men, they had been with Jesus every single day. The only time Jesus separated from them, guys, listen, was just to go and pray. And when he did go and pray by himself, he always took three that he poured into the most, Peter, James, and John. And the Bible says they were always just a stone's throw away, right? But they were always with Jesus. Now Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm going to leave you, and it's not going to be like before. Like, I will depart from you. So you can imagine that Jesus is giving them a time, and he keeps saying it's going to happen really, really soon. Now, we know according to the chronological flow of the New Testament, Jesus is just moments away from going to the cross. He's giving this final message to his disciples that he is going to be leaving and in a sense, Jesus is giving them a final charge and saying, this is how you will have to fare in my absence. This is how you will have to navigate through life as I'm gone. But, but then he kind of starts to talk these things to them that they're kind of like, well, wh where are you going? And he says, well, you know, where I go, you cannot go, but you know the way where I go. No, we don't know. Jesus says, yes, you do, because Jesus' ministry with his disciples has always been leading them to the Father, and that one day that they would be with the Father, and this is what he says here in John chapter 14. This is kind of how he starts the entire thing off. Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. This is what he's telling them here in John 14. He's encouraging them that even though that he will depart, he promises that he will come again and receive them unto himself. So in chapter 16, Jesus dropped many, many bombshells on them, okay? And Jesus is saying that even in his departure, they will have joy. This is what he's going to introduce to them. And this is something perhaps they need to hear. Because what they're thinking in their mind is what life is going to look like without Jesus. But what Jesus is trying to get them to understand is physically I will not be here. But in the spirit I will. And what you have of me now you will still have of me then but he introduces the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit to them. And we talked about the personhood of the Holy Spirit last week. We talked about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working in unison, the three being one, and God being the Father, God being the Son, and God being the Holy Spirit. And Jesus 
is reiterating the promise of the Father in John chapter 14, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, in chapter 16, in verses 1 through 15, Jesus, once again, starts off chapter 16 with this coming rejection, right? Then he begins to work in the work of the Holy Spirit, and he talks about the Spirit's ministry and purpose. And I think this is really important because we have to learn to trust in what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit and not to get caught up in, you know, these <laughs> emotional outbursts, if you will, and things that are attributed to the Spirit that, that are not even a work of the Spirit. But Jesus said this very thing. However, when the Spirit of truth has come, so just listen to what Jesus is saying. And, and, and what Jesus says in verse 13, if you do a proper study of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Revelation, I mean, the Spirit's working in the Old Covenant, in the New Covenant, this um, outpouring of the Spirit on the church in the New Testament, everything is within the framework of what Jesus has said in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 in regards to the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. So I think it's remarkable because oftentimes many try to attribute things to the Spirit that in a sense I think they mean well and and in a sense, it kind of looks good, but just because there's well-meaning intentions and just because it looks good doesn't mean that it's of the Lord. And what we want is what God has declared with the Spirit. So Jesus says, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, take that first part of verse 13 and apply that to what he is relating to them in regards to suffering and rejection. In the midst of um, chaos and confusion and turmoil, when there's such an assault on your Christian walk and your faith in Christ as there is today, what we have to cling to is truth. And the truth that the believer has is the truth of the Word of God. And this becomes the foundation and the anchor for the Christian soul. Jesus said that he will guide you into all truth. All truth. So the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit is for the purpose of you being guided into all truth. Now, Jesus did say in verse 14 at the start of this discourse, what did he say? I am the, the truth. Right? So he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So the Spirit's job is to continually guide us into all truth. Jesus is the truth. There is no other truth. Okay? You should put that in all capital letters in your notes tonight. There is no other truth. Jesus declared himself to be the truth. And how do we know this? Well, if you look in the original language, you'll notice that the word the is what we call the definite article in the Greek language. And it's kind of, let me give you the idea. It's very simple. You can find it in, in John chapter 1, where I believe it's verse 29, 26, where uh, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in that statement alone, 29, he says here, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, look at what he says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John didn't say, behold, a lamb. He said, the lamb. Now, honestly, John is speaking about a lamb that was promised. There were many lambs. I mean, this whole sacrificial system of Israel was based upon what? Offering up, you know, these lambs, right? But was he talking about the lambs of the sacrificial system? Was he talking about um, the lambs that were being prepared for sacrifice, you know, in the shepherd's fields of Bethlehem? We read this story. Was, was he talking about those? You got to understand that when he says the lamb, you know, in their mind, they're thinking, well, of course we got lambs. It's, it's what their whole system was based on. But when he said the lamb, he wasn't talking about their religious system. 
He wasn't talking about what they felt was uh, their way of making things right with God because to them, they, they looked at what God gave them uh, for um, atonement, if you will, in that regard, right? The offering up of a lamb, the sacrifice. But, but they looked at it more as a work in the sense that, God, you have to because we've done this now. At least that's what it became by the time Christ came on the scene. It wasn't as holy as Abraham and, and all these that built altars unto the Lord, and they offered these things as a thanksgiving to the Lord. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Now, in Genesis 22, we, we know the story very well. Abraham goes to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, right? And as he's ready to thrust the knife into his, his son, uh, the angel of the Lord stops him and says, now the Lord knows you love him. And we know that amazing story there because Abraham was going, but what, what was the, the faith of Abraham? When Isaac asked his dad, we have the wood, we have the altar, we have everything, but where's the sacrifice? Well, Abraham knew that God told him to sacrifice his son. He wasn't going to say, uh, you're, you're the man. No, he he said, the Lord will provide for himself the lamb. And then we see the binding of Isaac, right? And he's placed on the altar. And then he's almost <laughs> sacrificed by Abraham. The angel of the Lord stops him, and immediately a ram is caught in the thicket. But the lamb was never provided. It was a ram. And so they got the ram, and they offered that, and then here we are, you know, these 2,000 years later, right? And there it is, John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then we know that by that time, that mountain that Abraham went up, Mount Moriah, you know, it's the same mountain that Jesus then goes up on and is offered up as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So that's how you see the difference in what the term, the word the, in the original language. So in Greek uh, terminology, in Greek grammar, it's called the definite article. And that's where a lot of debate is, you know. Uh, in, and you might say, well, that doesn't really mean anything. It does. It means a lot. There's denominations, false teachers, and occults that have been created by this whole mess with um, poor hermeneutics and translation of scripture in regards to John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when you look a little bit further down, in uh, starting right around verses 8 down to 18, you begin to see there's no definite article before the word God. And so there's a group that assumed that they could remove that you know, and, and, or excuse me, uh, place a definite article there only because they felt that there needed to be one there. And so what they did is they took John 1.1 1, 1 and they said, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was a God. Now, no Greek scholar would ever say, even though there's no definite article there, the, 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 the issue is that they say, well, there needs to be one. And so this is why we inserted um, the letter A to say a God. So Jesus is a God, but not the God. And then they, they take the word God and rather than make it a capital G, they make it a lowercase g. And so this is how they base their thing that Jesus is not God, but that he's a lower type God. And thus, that's the J-dubs. For those of you who don't know, Jehovah's Witness. But then they go down and they read a little further. And if you just show them, well, there is the name God, again, how come you didn't put the definite article there? And so what they do is what they call is, is a violation of what is known as the Groundsville Sharp Rule in regards to them inserting what would be known as a definite article. So that's why it's important, because all this leads to something. And when Jesus said, in the same way that John said, behold the lamb, there's only one lamb, that could do what John said will happen, and that is take away the sins of the world. You know how many lambs had been offered up? And how many lambs had been given in sacrifice and the sins of the world had not been dealt with? But John says, the lamb. He didn't say a lamb. 
because then the sins of the world could not be. But it's the Lamb. In the same way that the Spirit comes and He will guide you into not a truth or some truth, but He will guide you into the only truth, which is all complete truth, that is, in who Christ is. So what is the purpose and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit that is to guide us into all that Christ is while He is presently seated at the right hand of the Father, He is in us by way of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit is guiding and leading us into all truth. That's kind of how we closed out last week's study in the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will reveal uh, the glories of Christ is what we see here. But remember what we looked at. He guides us. That's what verse 13 is talking about. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25 teaches that he leads us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 as well. And then there's that reminder for us to not quench the spirit nor to grieve the spirit. Don't quench the spirit nor grieve the spirit. So he will guide you into all truth for he will not listen to this. So what will he do? He will guide you into all truth but what he will not do, listen to this, he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you the things to come. And he will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of me. That's pretty interesting. So really, what does the Spirit have to offer you and I? Jesus. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of the Spirit in a person's life. And some people just say, oh, well, you know, the Holy Spirit is just, is just there to, uh, you know, to give us these giftings. Well, that's, that's a wrong view. Because the Spirit is so much more than just people exercising gifts. The, the Spirit is Christ in us. The hope of glory. That can only happen by way of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, in essence, is saying that though he will leave them, he will come back to them again. And, and he says it here in verse 16, and it puzzles them, but he's, there's two ways to look at this, but in essence, I think Jesus is saying both views. And what Jesus is saying here is, a little while you will not see me, and again, a little while you will see me. Okay, what are you talking about? Then he says, because I go to the Father. So we will not see you, but then we will see you. And some say that what Jesus is saying here, that when he says you will not see me, he's talking about his death, that he's going to be going to the cross, and obviously he's going to die, right? And then they say, or it could be that Jesus is speaking about his ascension, that there's going to be a time in which he ascends. And then he says, and then you will see me. And some say that the reason that they will see Jesus again is because of the resurrection. And they did see Jesus in his post-resurrection ministry for some 40 days, right? And, and seen by over 500 and by Peter. But then we also see that it could mean this is in reference to the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost because the word clearly declares the oneness that Jesus has with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is with us by way of the Holy Spirit. And so in a sense, I believe it's both. I believe it's, it's his death and his ascension, but I also believe that it's his resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the believer. And when Jesus says a little while, and, and why is this an encouragement? Because Jesus is about to suffer. They're going to see the suffering of Jesus. And in a sense, I think it's twofold. Jesus is reminding them, hey, listen, we got to suffer. We got to go through things. And, and because I'm about to suffer this horrible suffering, you're going to suffer pretty much all of them, but one were martyred. Think about that for a moment. So they all suffered. And this is why I think Paul's statement here in, in this is what he's saying in Philippians 1.29, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering. 
And so the Spirit comes to guide us into all truth, to lead us closer to Christ, that we grow more and more. And there is a constant working of the Spirit in our lives. Now, listen to this. All of this to encourage them that they will know the truth because Jesus said it in John 8, right? You shall know the truth and the truth will what? Right? So, and this truth, Jesus is still on the same topic here. The Spirit will keep them accountable to the truth that has been revealed to them while Christ was with them. But he's not going to be with them. He's going to leave them. And then he's telling them, and then some things are going to happen to you when I'm gone. But don't worry. He, in a sense, what Jesus is in essence revealing to them is though their hearts are sorrowful, and they are, they're, they're, they're devastated, and pain and sorrow and anguish has filled their hearts because of everything Jesus has been speaking to them. And, and though you and I could not relate to the disciples on this level because we could never experience what they experienced in the earthly ministry of Christ. But all of us here have experienced sorrow, right? And pain and hurt. And that comes in many ways. And what we glean from this is that the promise that Jesus is making, because we are his, because we are his, everybody say because. Because we are his, you will experience sorrow. You will have pain in your life. But Jesus is reminding them that, that there's, there's two ways to go through sorrow and pain. You can go through it with the Lord, or you can go through it without the Lord. And there's no third option. Well, can I just escape it? Paul said it's been granted for you to suffer. It has been granted. Like, people love blessings being granted to them. Like, oh, yes, right? But then Paul says, here's the other thing that's been granted. It's been granted for you to suffer for Christ's sake. So, this whole thing about the Holy Spirit and about the Spirit of truth and the Spirit guiding us, leading us. So, I say all that by way of introduction to say that the Spirit's ministry is to, listen to this, transfer their sorrow into joy. So that's, I think, something that's it. Now, now, how could we trust it? I just gave you in verse 13 just the importance of why it says the truth and the Spirit's job to keep us accountable to this truth. You see, the Spirit will not only uh, take our misinformation and transform it into truth because of who Jesus is, he will also take our sorrow and not replace it, but transform it into joy. To replace something doesn't take away from the emotion or the experience, but to transform it, in a sense, obliterates it and gets it away. And that's what the Spirit's job is doing in all of our lives. And Jesus encourages and reminds them this way. Now, he says this again, a little while you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me because I go to the Father. So how does sorrow become joy? Look at what he's saying here. Then some of the disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me. They're kind of like, what is he talking about? And because I go to the Father, what does this mean? Now, there are some things, guys, listen, that, that this goes back to verse 13. Jesus said, then the Spirit comes, he will what? He will lead you and guide you into all truth. That also would imply that the Spirit will make known to you the Word of God. That the Spirit will bring a revelation to you and an understanding, and here they are, and... They're not understanding anything Jesus is saying. And look at what he says. I just love how he kind of lays this out. They said, therefore, what is this that he says? In a little while, well, what is he talking about? And we don't know what he is saying. And sometimes that's just how things are, right? We don't know what God is doing. We don't know what, what and why he's allowing us to 
Uh, and I'm not just talking about suffering, but even be in a conversation or being a, you know, why am I in this? I have nothing to do with this. But all the while you're there, you know, and now you're planted and the Lord is, is, is allowing you. And sometimes we don't have the clarity. So what are we to do? We are to pray, right? And we're to seek the Lord and we're to say, okay, God. And never, ever do we ever make a decision on emotion. But always go to the word of God and make a decision according to his word. Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And, and so, in other words, here they are discussing among themselves. And, and maybe they were afraid to ask him. I don't know. But they're discussing among themselves. What is he talking about? Listen, they already have all this other stuff on their mind. And now Jesus just lays this on them. But look at what he says. He says, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? I just love that about the Lord, man. It's like you don't get away with anything. <laughs> he knows everything we're thinking. But, but here's what he does. He says, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Is this what you're inquiring about? Is this what you have no, um, you don't understand what I'm saying. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Now he's kind of giving him some clarity and he's saying, listen, what I'm actually saying is, you know, when I go, the world's going to rejoice. Why? Why is the world going to rejoice that Jesus is dead? Because they hate him. It's what he just told them. The world hates me, and it's going to hate you, and, and, and you're going to sorrow. The world will rejoice, and you will sorrow. But what's going to happen for you is that because I go, and because the world hates me, Jesus then goes on to say, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. In a sense, you can look at Jesus as kind of saying, I have to die in order for you to experience this sorrow being transformed into joy. And one of the things about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, guys, listen, when you look at Galatians chapter 5 and you look at what Paul says in regards to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, you'll see that... Paul kind of lays out some, some things about this, about the flesh and the spirit. And this is what he says in Galatians chapter 5. He says it in verse 16. He says, Then I say, Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the likes of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So a person who practices these things, listen, they're, and they could say that they're, they're Christian, they're not. Because Christians don't do this. Does it mean that a Christian can have a weak moment and do something? He's talking about living this life, like literally, this is their lifestyle, and they have no desire of st stopping. Okay? So he says this is the fruit, this is the... The outworking, this is the evidence of a person walking in the flesh. Now look at this. He goes on to say, but, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And then look at what he says. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Love, joy, and peace. Now, when you see it, there's one fruit, nine different elements. 
But just think of this. Love, joy, and peace. This is what Jesus is offering just in chapter 16. Your sorrow will be turned to joy. Now listen, all of us want a good life. No? Okay, good. You guys got real holy in here right now. I'm like, wow, okay, humble, humility, all right. I got it. <laughs> we all want a blessed life, don't we? Okay, you, you want the goodness in life. And, but you can get things in life and, 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 and live, you know, I guess you could say an okay life. You know, some people have that. They have a decent, they're not walking with the Lord, but they have a decent life. They have, they have no worries. They have, you know, it's like things are just, like it's just their life. But that's happiness. And they're happy. They're content. Now, God doesn't promise us happiness in that regard. He does say that we can be happy people, but, but happiness, the way the scriptures reveal it, is, is short-lived. Now, joy, on the other hand, it's different than happiness. Joy is eternal. And as a matter of fact, things in life can, can make you happy. The word can make you happy. Walking with the Lord can make you happy. But what happiness doesn't offer is what joy offers. And that is joy is given by God and it's eternal. And why is that important? Because if happiness is short-lived, then that means your joy could never be taken from you if it's been given to you by God. And this is what Jesus is introducing here. Even though you're going to have sorrow and pain in your life. I mean, just really think. This is as sure as the truth that I've revealed to you throughout my teachings. This is what Jesus is saying to them. You know the truth because it set you free. You know that I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit will guide you into all truth. And what is he saying? As a result of this very thing, you're going to experience joy. It doesn't replace your sorrow. Your sorrow's transformed into joy. Only God can do that. Only God can take the very pain and the mess and the suffering and the persecution and the difficulties, however we look at it today from the context of our lives, not the lives of the disciples, but just in the context of our lives. Let me tell you something. You might be experiencing sorrow right now, but at the end of the day, you still have that joy unspeakable joy and even though there might be pain guess what people are wondering man how are you still standing how are you still moving forward and persevering because the joy that the father gives and so this is what Jesus was telling them like you can have joy in the midst of sorrow because your sorrow will be transformed into joy and so the point that Jesus begins to relate to them in verses 20 and 21 Jesus is saying that that joy is revealed in a time of sorrow so in a sense listen sorrow serves its purpose in our lives now, I know we don't like it but it does it highlights it illuminates it draws attention to it it, it gets us to begin to think of of what is more meaningful because that's what sorrow does it causes you to look up out and this is why I want to say to us here tonight and to those that are watching via live stream that that your time of pain and sorrow to some degree however it has come you know, all of it is different that's why Peter he says these various trials in his epistle. He says there's, there, there's, all, there's all types. But your sorrow will be turned to joy. This is what God promises. So it serves its purpose for some to remind us that we have joy. <laughs> I don't like how that sounds. And maybe... You know, if I had more than one service on Wednesday night, I probably wouldn't say it in the next service. But sorrow does serve in reminding us of the joy that we find in the Lord. Now, some would say, so if I am reminded all the time of this joy, will sorrow happen? Unfortunately, Jesus said it will. Because we live in a fallen world. But listen to this. Don't 
lose heart. Jesus says to this whole picture here, he says, but your sorrow will be turned. Look at the word there, turned. Circle that if you want. The original language, the word means to cause to generate. Isn't that interesting? To cause to generate. The, the idea and the picture there is not a, we're going to replace it with this. It's a transferring into. So God takes you and I, right? Just the way we are. Doesn't he? He doesn't say, hey, you know, you need to go get cleaned up a little bit. You, know, you need to go, you need to go and look different, right? Now, I, I know there's people that are like that. Thank God that... You know, he, he's not a person like us, but he takes us just as we are because he doesn't look at the outside. He doesn't look at, oh, you know, they don't, you know, they don't represent me well or whatever. Man looks at those things. This is what the Lord had told, um, you know, Samuel when he was going and anointing a king, right? And he, he told him a very profound truth. You know, as Samuel was looking for the tall, the, the, the best one, like surely this has to be the one. The Lord's like, nope, that's not him. And then it's like, do you got another son? Yeah, you know, he's a little guy. He's out there in the shepherd field, man. And, you know, you know, you know, you know we'll call him. Oh, okay, go get him. You know, David comes in. He's, you know, skipping along, you know, coming in, just happy to be taking care of his father's sheep. And the Lord's like, that's the guy. And, and, he, and he reminds his prophet that God looks at the heart. And then the Lord reminds the people of Israel and Samuel and us in the word that David was a man after his own heart. That's what qualified him. So God takes us just as we are, guys, listen, and, and he sees us because he sees, you know, his image in us. And in essence, he's going to get glorified through our life. That's one of the benefits and the blessings. But then look at, so he takes us just as we were. And some of you probably didn't look as bad as others when they were first rescued by the Lord. Well, I know, man, come on now, you know? I, I mean, I, would, I, was, I was sucked up, man, you know? And yeah, I was, I was bad, you know? But, and I look now, and you know, I'm all cute and chubby now, you know? <laughs> but uh, I am, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> But no, you know, you look at people and it's an amazing thing because listen, I'll see people come in here and, and some of you, you know, you, you come, you came in and it's like, man, look at you. And then a year goes by and they're still here and it's like, look at you now. You know, and okay, so, you know, they probably dress a little different now, look a little, you know, because life's a little bit different for them. But that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a person who... God didn't say, hey, you want to know what? I got to take, you, you, I got to just like destroy you and recreate a new one of you from the ground up. No, God says, I will take this who you were and I will transform you into the image of my son. Ah, you guys don't get it, man. <laughs> Boy, you don't get it. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're just kind of like, you know, look at me. God help. I don't. I look at me, I'm like, mm, look at you. You cute little thing, you. <laughs> oh, man. Help me, Lord. All right. <laughs> but God, God wants to shape and pattern us into the image of his son, Jesus. And we get excited over the little blessings, right? But the Lord is saying, that excites you? Just wait till I'm done with you. This is, this is the picture. So what does it look like, sorrow being transformed into joy? Think of yourself. And how God has transformed you. Listen, we're not perfect, but he is. But I can assure you that some of us have been on this journey for a while and you don't think like you used to think. You don't do the things you used to do, and you don't handle things the way you used to handle them. And at the end of the day, why? Because he's transforming you. It's still the same you, but there's a transformation, and that only comes by way of the Holy Spirit. So you get now what he's saying to them, but they're like, what do you mean? A little while, you're going to be here. You're not, you're not going to be here. 
right? Look at what he goes on to say here. And so he says, here's how he explains it to him. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. And isn't that so true? Boy, women go through it, man. You got these, you know, humans, like a whole other person in your body. Like, that's crazy. And everything you go through, like from walking straight to waddling, you know, it's like everything changes. Then you go through this pain of having this child. But then the moment they put that child in your, it's like you're not crying because of the pain. The pain's gone. You're crying because this is, this is, this is you, right? And that little thing, boy, don't they look crazy when they're born. They look like little... California raisins, man. They just, they end up getting cute later on, but you know how it is. But that's kind of how it is. That's the picture that he's saying. And ultimately what he's saying is he reminds them that there is a joy that will overpower and overrule any sorrow, pain, chaos, trouble, or turmoil. So the joy that the Lord offers us and gives us by way of the Spirit, here by way of Jesus, Jesus is saying the way to get this is I got to go so he can come, right? Look at this. Therefore, you now have your sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice and your joy, listen to this, no one will take from you. You see what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, you do have sorrow right now, but that sorrow is going to be transformed into joy. And when that happens, nobody can take it from you. Nobody can take it from you. Think about that, guys. And so when you start to go through a trial and adversity in your life and, and your joy is not there, the joy of the Lord is not your strength, you need to stop and take inventory and say, okay, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm counteracting what the Spirit is doing in my life. And that can come by way of getting bitter. Listen, when you go through a severe trial in your life, let me help you with something. There's two ways you can respond. You can either become bitter or you can become better. And the difference between the two is the letter I. Become better, not bitter. And because we can be bitter people, Listen, joy, unspeakable joy. That's, isn't that a song they sing here in our church? Boy, yeah, that song, man. You know, it, it, this is it. Listen, it, it even goes with a lot of songs written. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. I mean, think about it, joy came. Jesus is saying here, this joy is not that the world, if... If the world could offer joy, then there's no need to write that song, Joy to the World, the Lord Has Come. Well, because he brought joy into this world, into this chaos and mess and destruction and suffering and sorrow and pain, and all of us are recipients of that. The scriptures say it, and even more so, now that you're a follower of Christ, your, your suffering senses, if you will, are awakened. And now it's like you have the enemy on one side saying, the reason why you're suffering and the reason why you're going through what you're going through is because you're a bad person. And because God doesn't love you, because you deserve to go through what you're going through. Isn't this amazing that our dear sister, this is what she prayed right before she closed out the set list, that we would not be discouraged because we blew it today? I didn't talk to her about the sermon. But here's the point. That some of us really view God in this way that, that God is, in a sense, withholding joy from us when, when, in essence, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, joy was given to you at that very moment by way of the Holy Spirit. He indwells the believer. So you have what Jesus is saying here to the disciples that, that they will experience by way of his going and then them not seeing him, but then they will see him. And Jesus is saying, there's a purpose in behind what I'm doing. You might have sorrow right now, but 
You're having sorrow because you hear that I'm going to leave you. You hear that one's going to betray me. You hear that, that one's going to deny me. You hear that you're going to be hated by the world. You hear that, that you're going to be persecuted. And they're just kind of like, and you're leaving? Yes, so that your joy may be full. Think about this. Look at what he goes on to say. Therefore, now uh, you have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. Listen to this. And no one will take your joy from you. No one will take it from you, guys. Listen. That is such an amazing truth. Don't let no one steal your joy. Don't let no one take it from you. Look at what Acts chapter 13 says. I like this in, in regards to this whole thing of joy and let no one take it from you. The Bible says here, and I love this. It says here, the Jews, verse 50, the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. Listen to this. So they got kicked out. They got, boy, they went through all kinds of stuff, right? Listen. And he says, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They just got like the boot. They got persecuted, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Look at what chapter 5 says. I like this. Book of Acts, chapter 5. I, you read the whole book of Acts, man, on persecution. It's just so, it's so awesome to see what, what it's done. It, but, but, but look at what it says here. And the Bible says this. It says, so, verse 41, Acts 5, 41. So they departed from the presence of the council. Listen to this. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name that they were counted worthy, like we're worthy, we're Christian enough to be persecuted. Just think about that for a moment. You know, you know that thing people always say, there was a, you know, if you were on trial for being a Christian, is there enough evidence for you to be convicted? These guys, you couldn't get them with that. They'd have been like, boy, you know, for Jesus' name to be going through this, and daily in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. This that we read in Acts was fueled by John chapter 16. This passion to have joy and to think we have been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ Jesus it's because no one can take it from us. And in that day, you will ask me, listen to this, in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And some people look at that and they say, that's another weird verse. What does he mean in that day, you will ask me nothing? In that day, that their sorrow is transformed into joy, the day they receive the Holy Spirit, they're not going to need to ask Jesus because they can't. He's not going to be with them. So who do they ask? He says, you're going to ask the Father. That's what he means. And look at this. I, 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 I use this passage a lot to just tear into people who say that they pray to these, <clears throat> these, these saints to get to God. Just listen to what Jesus is saying. I love this. This is what I hit them with, okay? Everybody gets the whole, there's only one mediator between. That's, that's okay, but this is better. Listen. Look at what he goes on to say. So he goes, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now listen to this. So Jesus goes on to say here that joy is in, joy is refreshed through answered prayer. So we see here that, that, that joy is revealed in a time of sorrow, Joy is resistant in every attack. Joy is refreshed through answered prayer. And then he's on this topic now of speaking to the Father, okay? Listen to what he's saying here. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In other words, what is he saying? After his death and resurrection, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, 
all things will become that much more clear. And a time is going to come when you're just going to get the word of God. You're going to understand it because of who the spirit is. Okay, now listen to what he says. I love this. In that day, you will ask, listen to this, in my name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the father for you. You hear what Jesus just said? I'm not up there and you're asking. And then I go to the father and I ask for you. When you ask in my name, I'm not going to the Father for you. You're going to pray directly to the Father, but you're going to ask in the name of his Son. So what is Jesus saying here? The only thing that Jesus mediates between us and the Father is reconciliation. He reconciles us unto the Father by his death on the cross and his Victory by the resurrection of the dead. And now he is seated, as Mark's gospel says, at the right hand of the Father. And Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, forever interceding. Romans chapter 8 and verses 34 and on, making intercession for you and for I. But, but he's not up there. What he's not doing is he's not saying, okay, this is what David asked for. Now, Father, let me plead with you so you can give it to him. No, what Jesus is constantly doing is because we have an adversary... Who is accusing us day and night? And it's the enemy. And as he accuses us day and night in the heavenlies, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for those things that are being spoken against us. Because what Satan wants more than anything is for God to charge us with the real us. But when he looks upon you and me, he sees the blood of his son, Jesus. Jesus intercedes for us because we have an adversary, the devil, who is daily accusing us. And this is why we have an intercessor on our behalf. But Jesus is saying very clearly here, because of the Holy Spirit, you don't need me to go to the Father. You now have access to speak to the Father yourself. Jesus says, I'm not saying I'm going to pray for you to the Father. You can pray to the Father, just ask in my name. And what does it mean to ask in the name of Jesus? Some people really believe that to pray in the name of Jesus means you're going to get what you pray for because you asked in the name of Jesus and then you're believing by faith. Listen, Jesus is not talking about that here. And you're wrong if that's what you've interpreted and or if you ever taught anybody. To ask in the name of Jesus means to ask according to the ministry of Jesus Christ and the will of the Father. That's so when you pray, what are you praying? Your prayers, if you can look at them and categorize them and maybe put them in two sections. And as one person put it in, in a commentary one time when I was reading, they says, when, when it comes to prayer, write two things. Write comfort on one side of the paper and the will of God on the other. And begin to put your prayers that you prayed and ask yourself, if God answers this prayer, is it for my comfort or is it for his will? And you want to know what you're going to find out? Your comfort has a longer list than his will. So that's why you don't get what you pray for, because you're not praying according to his will. When you ask in the name of Jesus Christ, you're asking according to the will of God. So, all your prayers can be answered if you pray his will. And think about it. This is what Jesus is saying to them here. You guys, you're going to be okay. Hello? Look to your neighbor and tell them they're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. For the Father himself loves you. Boy. Look at this, guys. For the Father himself loves you. This joy is rooted in a reconciled life. You know why God blesses you? Oh, because, you know, I'm, I'm faithful to the church, Pastor. I give, I tithe, just so you know. No, God blesses you because he loves you. 
I know some pastors are afraid to say this over the pulpit, but I'll say it because I've never been um, dependent upon the tithes and offerings in this church. Never have. I don't, we, we don't even ask for money here. I, that's not even anything I worry about other than, you know, God will provide. He always does. What I do pray about finances is that I never misappropriate the Lord's money and make sure that I'm being a good steward with everything that comes in. But as far as like, hey, guys, we need money. I mean, some of you have been with me for years. Some of you have been with me for 10 years. I've never asked for money over this pulpit. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Because the way I see it is the way Pastor Chuck taught me. Where God guides, he provides. And then I say, if it's the Lord's will, it's his bill. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's all taken off of me, man. <laughs> but here's the point. Look at what he's saying. God blesses you because he loves you. There are people who never tithe that are just as blessed as those who tithe. That's what pastors are afraid to say over the pulpit. Because you want to know why? Because they're afraid that people are going to hear that and they're going to stop giving. It's not my job to convict you in giving. I could teach you what the Bible says about it, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you. Trust me, if it was mine, all my messages would be hellfire and brimstone. I am so <laughs> thankful that, and some of you are like, they are, Pastor. Well, no, no, you're just convicted because you're in sin. That's even better. No, listen. No, listen, our messages would have to be that, trying to convict people and trying to make them do stuff. And you want to know what, guys? I, I, I was under that type of teaching for years. And it never, it never did anything for me other than made me miserable. It never made me aware of my struggles and sin in my life because it always made me feel like I was not doing enough or good enough for the Lord. But now that I'm aware of what sin is and that a real man, a real woman of God, listen, will struggle with things in their life, but by his grace and by his spirit, we can rest in that God is not done with us and he's working through us and all these things that we worry about, listen, commit them to the Lord. He's gonna take care of it. He got you. You're good. You're okay. Why? Because he loves you. That's why. That's what it says right here. And he's telling them, he says, listen to this. He says, the, the father loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from him. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, see, now you are speaking plainly. <laughs> They're like, we, we understand you now. And using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. And then Jesus says this, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Listen to this. So, so just because you understood a little something, you, you got it now. No, Jesus is saying, you got to go through what I'm saying you're going to go through here in order to get it. Look at what he goes on to say. Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And was he not alone on the cross? But Jesus says, I wasn't alone. Because the Father, he knew that he was doing even, even, even the pain of the cross and even the Eli, Eli Lama, Sabathani of the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even that Jesus knew was fulfilling the purpose, the will, the plan of the Father. Jesus faithfully, the Bible says, despising the shame he endured. Because there was a joy set before him. What joy is that? You and me. That was the joy, that joy would come to the world. Listen to this, guys, and then he closes with this. I love it. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, the persecution of the believers. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 